We're going to talk tonight about God's covenant with Adam and Eve. Uh, the topic is God's covenants with humanity. Last week, as I said before, we did an introduction to what is a covenant, and we kind of defined what a covenant is and how they originated, and uh, the fact that God is the one who makes covenants. And we have six major covenants that God has made with humanity. Now, there's lots more covenants in the Bible than just the ones we're going to cover. But the ones that we're going to cover are particularly uh, applicable to your life and to mine as believers in Jesus Christ and as disciples of the Lord. The first covenant we're going to talk about is God's covenant with Adam and Eve, and that goes all the way back to the very beginning. The Scripture says in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 28 to 28, that the first man and woman were created in the image and likeness of God. The Scripture says in Genesis 1, says, Thus God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I want you to know tonight that both man and woman were created in the image and likeness of God, not just man, just, not just men. God created woman out of man to demonstrate and reflect the kind of union and relationship he desires to have with us. You know, I often thought, you know, well, why didn't God create them both at the same time? You know, why didn't he create man and woman and just create a man here and create a woman right next to him and then breathe into both of them and they both stand up on their feet and both be a living soul? Well, it's because God wanted to demonstrate something, and that is that we are not separate species. Men are not from Mars. Women are not from Venus. <laughs> we are all from Earth, and man and woman are to be one, just like our spirit is to be one with the Spirit of God. The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused him to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and fashioned a woman from it and enclosed the place with flesh. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man and brought her to the man. So the interesting thing is when God began creation, he began with non-living dirt. He just began with the soil, and he formed the body. He breathed the nostrils, the breath of life, a man became a living being. But when it came time to make the woman, he didn't go back to the dirt. He already had a living being. He already had someone into whom he had breathed the breath of life. And so he took part of that living being. And from that living being, he created woman so that they were made out of the same material. They're not separate, but they're made out of the same material. And that's really, really important. Then Man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and felt no shame. God intended husbands and wives to be one flesh with one another and one in spirit with himself. And that's the reason why God created them out of the same material. Because the mystery of the gospel that we have today is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, we, we don't have a God who's way off here somewhere, separate from us, that hasn't identified with us. We have a God who has come to be one of us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And then the Scripture says that if we love Him, we'll obey what He commands, and that He and His Father will come and make their home within us. That's the promise that we have from the Lord. And so it's reflected here in the creation of man and woman that God created man out of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. He became a living soul. And then God took part of that living man and made a woman out of the same material, out of the same substance. And that is to symbolize the union that we are to have with the Lord. Well, let's talk a little bit about the image and likeness of God tonight. What is the image and likeness of God? The image of God is the substance of or essence of God, the substance 
or essence of God. Scripture reveals that God is spirit, and we have scriptures for that. John chapter 4, verses 21 to 24, and John 6, 63. Jesus said in John chapter 4, he said that the time is coming and now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For those are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And Jesus basically right come out and just told us what the image of God is. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And then on John chapter 6, 63, Jesus said, The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, the words I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. So Jesus tells us that the image of God, or the essence of God, the substance of God is spirit. And then not only does Scripture say that God is spirit, Scripture also says that God is triune. What does that mean? That means three in one. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. All three are God, and there's only one God. You look at John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him, not anything was made that was made. The Scripture also says that no one has ever seen God, but God, the only begotten Son, who is at the Father's side, has made Him known to us. So that is the image of God. The image of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, one God. Now, the interesting thing is, is that man, and when we say man, we mean man and woman both because the woman was created out of the same substance that the man was created out of, that man and woman both are created in the image and likeness of God. Just as God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God is spirit, man is triune, and he is also spirit. Spirit, mind, and body, all three, but they make up one man. It says in Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, that was his body, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, that was his spirit, and man became a living being. Now, if you read that in the King James Version, it says he became a living soul. And that word soul is the same word for mind. And it, so he has a spirit. It is a spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty that gives him understanding. The Spirit of God has made me, the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And if it were in his intention and he withdrew his spirit and breath, all mankind would perish together and man would return to the dust. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Now this is interesting. Uh, you know, we talk about God being three in one, the Father God, the Son God, the Holy Spirit God, and we know that there's no division in God. God is not divided. God, is ne ne God never disagrees with himself. <laughs> the Son never disagrees with the Father. The Father never disagrees with the Son or the Spirit. And the Spirit never disagrees with the Father or the Son. There's no division in God. Christ is not divided. And the same way, when we are created in the image of God, we are spirit, mind, and body, and we are not divided either. Our spirit and our mind, our spirit and our soul are fused together inside of our body. And the only thing that can accurately discern between the two is what we say here, the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. So that's the only thing that can accurately divide the soul and spirit, and that is the Word of God. And it reveals the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Praise God. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, it says... May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's where we see in Scripture that all three of them are brought together and referred to as making up the individual, as making up the person. So the first man that was ever created was created in the image of God. He had a spirit, a mind, and a body and there's one man, one person, and, and when any part of you is missing, you're not complete and whole. You know, you can, you can have uh, somebody can hook up machines to your body and keep your body breathing and keep blood going, you know, through the veins and keep the oxygen going in the blood, but if you've lost the ability to think, you know, they talk about people being brain dead. You're not complete. You're not whole 
unless all three of those are functioning according to the way God designed them to be and, and created them to be. And God is also spirit and triune. Father, Son, and Holy, Holy Spirit is one God, and man created in his image is one man. All right? Not only was man created in the image of God, he was also created in the likeness of God. Now, I used to think that the image and the likeness of God were the same thing. That when somebody said God created man in his image and his likeness, that that was just a way of saying the same thing in a different, in a different way. But something the Lord has shown me is that the likeness and the image of God are not the same thing. The image of God is the substance or essence of God, but the likeness of God is what God is like. I mean, God just doesn't exist in a vacuum. He doesn't just exist in, in solitude. He doesn't just exist in silence. He has an expression of himself. He has a personality. He has character. He has traits. And God not only created man in his image, he created him in his likeness. He created man to share in his characteristics, to share in his character, to share in his traits. And uh, the likeness of God is best understood in terms of his power and personality. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, God is the source of all life. God is the source of all life. That's one of his attributes. The Spirit gives life, Jesus said. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. What else about God's power? God is the source of all creative power. You know, he's the one who said, let there be light. And there was light. He's the one who said, let the waters be gathered together and the dry land appear and the seas. And he's the one that set the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky. He is the source of all creative power. And because we are created in his image and his likeness, we also have a limited degree of creative power. All the inventions of man, all the things that man has been able to do in the, in the past centuries has been because of the likeness of God. It's been because of the traits and the characteristics of God. Say, God is the source of all creative power. Anything we do is because he has enabled us to do it. Because he has gifted us out of his own character, out of his own personality, out of his own likeness. Not only that, God's power is the source of all knowledge. Well, you want to know something? The only knowledge that man can increase is knowledge from observation of the material world around him. God has more knowledge than that. God has knowledge of the material world, but he has knowledge of the spiritual realm as well. God has all knowledge. And if we really want to have knowledge, who do we need to go to for it? God. And God is also the source of all wisdom. Now, that's one thing that we lack a lot of times. Wisdom is knowing how to apply the knowledge. And did you know there's two kinds of wisdom? I'm not going to go off. That could preach itself. But uh, the Bible teaches there's two kinds of wisdom. The wisdom that comes from above and the wisdom that comes from below. The wisdom that comes from earth. What is that wisdom? That's the wisdom you get just by observation of life, just by living in the world. And the longer you live in the world, the more wisdom of the world you get. Now, whether you apply it or not, that's an entirely different matter. Because <laughs> there's some people who have knowledge, but they don't have wisdom, or they don't apply the wisdom that they do have. Amen? But the wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, as the Scripture says, peace-loving. Have you noticed with all of the knowledge and all of the advancement and all of the inventions and all of the prosperity and all of the things that we've been able to do as a human race, we still kill each other? We still have war? We still have conflict? We still have suffering? We still have pain? We still have poverty? We still have hatred? Why? Because although we have knowledge, we don't have the wisdom that comes from above. Because the wisdom that comes from above is, first of all, peace-loving and full of mercy. Oh, how much we need mercy today. Amen. Every time I get up in the morning, I thank God for his mercy. <laughs> 
every time you go to bed at night. Thank God for his mercy. And full of good fruit. Full of good fruit. That's the wisdom that's from above. So God is the source of all that. That's a part of his likeness, a part of his character, his personality. All right, what else? God's likeness is his personality, his character. What do we know about the character of God? Well, the Scripture teaches us that God is holy. God is holy. That's probably the number one characteristic that we need to keep in mind above everything else. God is holy. Will you say that with me tonight? God is holy. And you want to know something else? Being holy is probably the most important characteristic that you and I can have tonight. Why? Because God said in his word, be ye holy for I am holy. Well, why would he tell us to do that? What we said earlier, he created man in his image and likeness, created woman out of man to reflect the kind of union and relationship he desires to have with us. He desires to be united with us in our lives, walking with us day by day, and in order for that to happen, we can't have anything between us and him. And the only way to have that is to be holy as he is holy. That's what we should pursue more than anything else. God, make me holy. God, help me to grow in holiness. Help me to grow separating myself from everything that is not like you, everything that is the opposite of who you are. Lord, help me to be set apart from that. Help me to separate from that in my life and to have a heart and a mind that is, is totally devoted and totally hungry and totally seeks after you. Why? Because God wants to have union with us. He wants to be in us. He wants to be with us. He wants to walk with us. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. God's likeness, his personality, his holiness. God is holy. God is also righteous. That means he doesn't wink at you when he gives you a promise, like, I don't really mean it. Or, you know, just wait until I get elected, and then you'll have more freedom to do what you want to do. I don't know who said that, but, uh, you know. He's righteous. His word is his bond. He never lies. He never deceives. He never cheats. He never talks out of both sides of his mouth. He never talks behind your back. <laughs> Most of the time he confronts you. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. <laughs> but he's righteous. And he wants us to be righteous as well. He wants us to share in his likeness, to share in his personality, to share in his traits. And God is merciful. Are you glad for that tonight? Hallelujah. The older I get, the more thankful I am for the mercy of God. Because when I look back, I understand now, David, I think he said it in Psalm 25. He said, God, don't remember the sins of my youth. <laughs> and I can agree with that 100%. God, don't remember the sins of my youth. But Lord, forgive me, cleanse me, wash me, make me clean and use me for your glory in this present time. So, God is merciful. God is also just. See, a lot of people misunderstand. They think that because God is merciful, and we're going to go to the next one here in a minute, God is love. They think because God is merciful and God is love that they can pull the wool over God's eyes. They can get by with stuff, and God is on the hook, and he doesn't have, he doesn't have the ability to call them to account. But friends, one of the personality traits of God, one of the part of the likeness of God, is that he, not only is he merciful, not only is he love, but he is just. In fact, the Scripture says in one place that he will repay those with trouble who trouble you if you're his child. Why? Because he's in covenant with you. And whatever your needs are is his needs. And so as a covenant God, he is going to keep covenant with you. And if people are giving you trouble, he says, whoever touches you touches the apple of my eye. God cares about you. And he's for you and not against you. All he wants you to do is keep covenant with him. He keeps covenant with you. And he wants us to keep covenant with him. So not only was man made in the image of God, not only is he a spirit 
and triune, but he was also created in the likeness of God. He was created to share in God's power and personality, to share in the characteristics of God. All right? We're talking tonight about God's covenant with Adam and Eve. All right, and this is where we're really getting into the covenant part of it. It says, Adam and Eve were given delegated authority over the earth as stewards of God's creation. That was the covenant God made with them. He said, I am going to bless you. This is how it said it exactly. It says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That was the introduction of God's covenant with Adam and Eve. Those were the terms. Those were the promises of the covenant. God was going to give them dominion over the earth. Out of everything that God said that he was going to give man, Adam and Eve in this covenant, he did not give him the right to rule over other men. And what is it that we have spent all our time doing? What are we getting ready to do right now? We're getting ready to have an election for somebody to rule over us. <laughs> somebody other than God. Now, I'm not advocating like pastor was saying the other day. I'm not advocating revolutionaryism, you know, like uh, with the coin and everything. But uh, God never said that men would have the authority by God's authority to rule over other men. That wasn't his original intention. His original intention was is that we would be all ruled over by him that you and I would both be filled with his spirit, be filled with his presence, be filled with his power, be filled with his personality, and be filled with his presence. And God would rule over me, God would rule over you, and we'd be able to be together in unity and be together in love because God was over each of us. That's exactly what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. The Scripture says that God's intention is to bring all things. This is the end goal. God's intention is to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head. And it's not the Republicans. It's not the Democrats. It's not the communists. It's not the capitalists. It is not the rich. It's not the poor. It's Jesus. Jesus is the one whom God has appointed as king over the earth. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the one who is going to have a kingdom that will never pass away, never stop expanding throughout the universe. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is king of kings and lord of lords tonight, and he reigns from a throne in heaven on the right hand of God the Father, and he reigns in the hearts and minds and bodies of every man and woman who believes on him and calls on his name. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Oh, blessed be Jesus. <sighs> Hallelujah. As stewards of God's creation, Adam and Eve had to learn to walk by faith and live in obedience to God's word. Now you see, as you and I study this tonight and we open up the word tonight and we see the scripture tonight. We're looking at it in hindsight. In other words, we have the Bible, we have the scripture, we have the word of God, and we can read about what had already happened in the past and what the results were and everything like that. And we have the advantage of all of that knowledge. We have the advantage of all of that. But Adam and Eve didn't have a Bible. How many of you thought they did? Don't, don't raise your hand if you do. They didn't have a Bible. They had the presence of God, and they had a perfect environment in which they were called to live and walk in faith and obedience to God and His Word. But you see, God has a purpose for us being here. God has a purpose for us, and part of that purpose is to teach us to walk by faith and to live in obedience to His Word. And if you can't find any other reason for being around here, that's a good enough reason right there. God has you here to learn more of him. God has you here to learn to walk by faith. God has you here to walk in obedience to his word and to reflect his glory to everyone around you. 
Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord tonight. God placed Adam and Eve in a controlled environment where he could teach them and have fellowship with them. That's why he put them in the Garden of Eden. He didn't want them to have to worry about anything at the very beginning except learning about him, learning who he was, learning of his ways, gleaning, gleaning from his knowledge, gleaning from his wisdom. He put them in that garden so that they would be in an environment where they didn't have to worry about how am I going to find something to eat? How am I going to find something to drink? God put them in a controlled environment where he could take the time to be with them and to teach them. Scripture says in Genesis chapter 2, Now the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And God placed Adam and Eve in the garden to work it. Work was invented by God. I know we like to talk about marriage being invented by God. Work was invented by God. Why? Because God is a worker. The Scripture said that in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and everything in it. He worked for those six days. The Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. God created man's physical life, his body, to be sustained by the consumption of food. That's why he had the trees grow in the middle of the garden. He said, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden except the one in the middle. And I want you to notice something else here as well. God never told him before he ate of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, God never told him he couldn't eat the tree of life. Do you realize if he'd ate the tree of life before he ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he would live forever in the righteousness and the holiness and the personality and the power of God in his life, and every one of his children, you and me included, would have been born with that same situation. But his spiritual life, God created man's spiritual life to be sustained by direct fellowship and intimate communication with him. That is, that is how our spirit is sustained. Our spirit is sustained by fellowship with God. Our spirit is sustained by communion with God, by walking with the Lord, walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 8, and then it's repeated in Matthew 4.4 4, and Luke 4.4, 4, man does not live by bread alone. You know, the bread takes care of the physical life, the, the body. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The Word of God, our God's Word is the source of our spiritual life. God established a covenant between himself and Adam and Eve based on God's love for the man and woman he had created in his image and likeness. God loves. God is love. God loves you. God loves me. God even loves the people that don't love him. Now, because of his mercy, they're allowed to go on not loving him. They're allowed to go on not believing him. But time is going to run out. It's not going to go on forever and ever and ever. Eventually, there's going to come a day when God's justice catches up with his mercy. When God's justice catches up with his love, and there will be a day of reckoning, there will be a day of accountability, there will be a day of judgment for everyone who has ever lived on the face of the earth. And that's why it's so important for us to share the gospel with people, to share Jesus with people, because he is the only one who can give us deliverance, who can rescue us from the judgment that is coming. We have to come to Jesus. He is the source of our salvation. Amen? Praise God. A covenant, as we said last week, is a total commitment of life and resources for the benefit of another based on relationships and dependent on faith, hope, and love. So here were the terms of God's covenant with Adam and Eve. God provided spiritual and physical life through the food and through his words. 
He provided reproductive capability or cap capacity. He gave them dominion over the earth. He gave them plenty of food. He gave them a perfect environment and access to the tree of life. They couldn't have asked for anything more. They couldn't have asked for anything more than what God provided in their covenant. But they weren't satisfied with it. God required faith. That was the term of the covenant. In order for them to keep the covenant, they had to have faith in God. And what is faith? Faith is an unchanging trust and total reliance on God that leads to obedience to his commands. That's faith. Faith isn't standing here gritting my teeth with my eyes closed and thinking as hard as I can, I wish it were so, I wish it were so, I wish it were so, I wish it were so. No, that's not faith. Faith is an unchanging trust, first of all, in God. Though he slay me, Job said, yet shall I trust him. And faith is a total reliance on God. I don't get impatient with God and go ahead and do things my own way because God is too slow for me. Total reliance on God. And if it is genuine faith, it leads to obedience to his commands. I may not be happy all the time in my flesh, but because I have faith in him, I obey. Because I love him and he loves me, I obey. Do I do that perfectly? No. Do you do it perfectly? No. That's why we have his mercy and grace. But he is walking with us and talking with us and leading us from glory to glory more and more into conformity with the image of his son. And that's what it's all about. Amen? Praise God. God required faith, and that's what he required of Adam and Eve. People ask the question, well, why did God even allow the tree to be there? Why did God even allow to be tempted? Did God tempt him to commit sin? No, God didn't tempt him to commit sin. God was trying to teach him faith. God was trying to teach him that they don't live on bread alone. They don't live on the fruit of the trees alone. They don't live on the food of the garden alone. But they live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the problem we have today is we have abandoned God's word. We have abandoned God's way. We've given up on him. And we've decided to make our own way, make our own solutions. And so we have a catastrophe. We have chaos all around us when we need to get back to faith in God. You remember that old song? Faith in God can move a mighty mountain. Faith in God can calm the troubled sea. Faith can make the desert like a fountain. Faith can bring the victory. Oh, that's what we need, friends. His total, complete faith in God. Well, not only did God require faith, God required hope. What is hope? Hope is a confident expectation and patient perseverance based on the certainty of God's promise and faith in God's word. That's hope. If I have God's word on something, if God has said it, then that settles it. And if I have hope, if I have faith, I'll believe it. If I have hope, I'm waiting for it. Do you see the difference? If I have faith, I will obey. If I believe it, if I have hope, I'll expect it. I know that God has it for me. Hallelujah to God. A confident expectation and patient perseverance based on the certainty of God's promise and faith in God's word. Not only does he have f f hope, but love. What is love? Love is an affectionate response to God that desires him, welcomes him, is well pleased with him, and is contented with him. Love acts for the welfare of the one beloved, even at personal cost and sacrifice. That's what God calls us to because that's what God does for us. God loves us, and he calls us to love him, and he calls us to love one another an affectionate response to God, an affectionate response to each other, loving and desiring each other, welcoming each other, being pleased with each other, contented with each other, and contented with God. The problem a lot of people have today is they're not contented with God. They're not contented with God. 
They, they want God to be there when they need him. When they have a problem or they get in a mess and they need to be get, brought out of it or get delivered from it. But just to love and desire him for who he is, we have an absence of that today. You know, what God can do for me, that's great. But just to want him, just to be content with him, that's love. And then to act for the welfare of the one beloved, even at personal cost and sacrifice. That's what God did for us through his son, Jesus Christ. The penalty, of course, for breaking the covenant was spiritual and physical death. Genesis chapter 3 is where it all takes place. But the key issue in Genesis 3 was whether or not man would choose to live by faith and believe God and obey him. That's what it was all about. Adam and Eve broke their covenant, but God did not break his covenant with them. He said, in the day you eat thereof, you shall die. Well, what is death? Death is not unconsciousness. Death is not unconsciousness. You just don't die and then go to sleep and never wake up again. Uh-uh. Death is not annihilation. You don't, you don't just, you're just gone. And death is not ceasing to exist. A lot of people think that when they die, that's it. It's over. Not going to be anything more. Death, physical death, is separation of the human spirit from the body. That's all death is. It's a separation. God created us in his image and likeness, spirit, mind, and body to be fused together. That's what makes us a person. That makes us a living soul, a being. Death separates those two. We still have a spirit, but it's not in our body. We still have a body, but it's in the ground. I don't know what happens to the mind and the soul. It probably goes with the body or it goes with the spirit. One of the way I'm not going to say. Only word of God can divide those. But spiritual death is the separation of the human spirit from God. Now, which we think is worse? <laughs> I'd say spiritual death, wouldn't you? I mean, it's one thing to have your spirit, human spirit separated from your body. It's another way, thing to have your human spirit separated from God. And that's what the gospel is all about. The gospel is about making it possible for people not to have to experience that spiritual death, that second death of total, complete separation from God. The scripture says, when they ate of the tree, the eyes of both of them were open. They realized they were naked, sewed fig leaves together, made coverings for themselves. Sin separated them from God. They had fear they never had before. They had shame they'd never had before. Isaiah 59 says it like this. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. That's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's why they hid among the trees of the garden. They heard his voice in the garden. They were afraid because they were naked, because they were exposed, because they didn't have anything to protect them from this holy, righteous, powerful God that they suddenly felt they needed protection from that they didn't feel that before they disobeyed God. They didn't feel, feel that before they, they responded in unbelief and doubt and fear, thinking God was holding out on them. God had something that he wasn't giving them. God was going to give them everything. Everything that the devil promised Eve in the garden, God was going to give it to them in his time and in his season. But he brought them there for fellowship. He brought them there for teaching and training. He brought them there to spend time with them. But they weren't willing to wait on God's schedule. Ephesians chapter 4. So I tell you and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated. There's that word separated again. We say death was, it's separation. That's what's wrong with the world today. People are separated from God. That's what's going on all around us. People are separated from God. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance. When what is ignorance? Do you know there's a difference between being ignorant and being stupid? Do you know the difference? Ignorance just simply means you lack knowledge. Stupid means you might have some knowledge, but you totally lack wisdom. <laughs> Darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. 
Having lost all sensitivity to God, they have given themselves over to sensuality. So they've left the realm of the spirit. And they are back here in the realm of the body. See that? They, they have lost all sensitivity in the spirit realm because their sins have separated them from God and they're, they're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the hardening of their heart. What's their heart? We said heart was synonymous with what? Spirit. And they've given themselves over to sensuality. What? They've, they've abandoned the spirit realm and they've come over here to the fleshly realm and given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. That's the state of man without God in his life. Here's what it looks like in the form of a picture. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, create man in his image and likeness, desiring to have communion and fellowship with him, but sin puts a wall up between God and between man just as it put a wall up between God and Satan and the demons. So now man's spirit is, caught, is cut off from the Spirit of God because of sin, but it is not cut off from the influence of demons. It's not cut off from the influence of Satan. They're on the same side of the wall. And the man is defenseless because he doesn't have the indwelling power of God to defeat the power of the enemy. And the only one that can do that is the one who has Christ in them. Christ in them, the hope of glory. And so the spirit is influenced by Satan and his demons, and we need deliverance. We need salvation. We need to be set free. <laughs> the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, clothed them, and the, that's where the blood came in that was shed. That's where the life was exchanged because God said in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. The reason God didn't kill them immediately was because of his mercy and his grace, but there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be someone to pay the penalty of their disobedience, and so God allowed a substitute. He took another animal and shed its blood and then took it and covered them with those garments so that they would identify with the life of that animal that had sacrificed itself so that they could remain in the mercy and the grace of God. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. God made, God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife had clothed them. And the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to the, work the ground from which he had been taken. God promised to break the barrier of sin and bring deliverance and salvation to man. Genesis 3.15 is the first promise in Scripture of the Savior, the first promise in Scripture of Jesus Christ. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And the covenant with man. God keeps covenant. God is going to keep his covenant with Adam. That's why he sent Jesus Christ. We'll go into Scripture later on. We'll read where Jesus is the second what? Second Adam. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. The covenant will be fulfilled. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the seed of the woman. He's the seed of Abraham, the son of David, the promised Messiah, the anointed one. He is the source of eternal salvation for all who believe in him. And that's God's covenant with Adam and Eve, and it's still going to be fulfilled because Jesus is going to come, and he is going to make us like him. We do not know what we shall be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is.